It is one o'clock, and I uh, welcome everyone that is uh, on the line right now uh, to the Prey Reconstruction Initiative Winter Webinar Series. My name is Jamie Ellis. I work as the Natural Areas Coordinator at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and I am um, part of the Reconstruction uh, Prairie Reconstruction Initiative, or P. PRI. PRI is a community of prairie practitioners and researchers for more than 30 organizations working together to improve the practice of prairie reconstruction so they are biologically diverse, are ecologically functional, and resist invasion by non-native plants. Uh, as a group, we've developed a vegetation monitoring protocol uh, that you can find on the PRI website and a prairie reconstruction database for collecting a standard suite of data about reconstructions and stay tuned uh, this spring for for more news about our database project uh, we host learning opportunities including in-person field days and online events like this one where the pra prairie reconstruction community that's you can exchange experiences and uh, knowledge uh, with with each with each other Ah, and uh, thank you. I was supposed to have this PRI slide up, so I'll just leave that up for a little bit right, right now. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Cameras and micro microphones uh, are turned off uh, during the, the presentation. And so uh, if you have questions or comments for our speaker today, please uh, type them. Um, into the chat and we'll get to them at the end. And at the end, I will also turn on microphones and cameras. So this talk is being recorded and will be posted to the PRI YouTube channel um, later. And now I'm happy to introduce our speaker today. Um, Julianne Mason is the Restoration Program Coordinator for the Forest Preserve District of Will County. Uh, in Illinois. She has been doing prairie restorations and natural areas management in the Chicago region for the past 25 years. She has a, a bachelor's uh, degree in biology from Earl Ham, Earlham, Earlham, I, I always get that confused, Earlham College in Indiana, and a, a, a master's of science degree in natural resources and environmental sciences from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Outside of her natural areas work, she enjoys yoga, Sudoku, traveling, and spending time with her family. And I am delighted to welcome uh, Julie as our speaker today. So I will, I'll stop sharing my screen so you can share your screen and you can um, start as you're ready. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jamie. And thank you for the, uh, the um, time here to do the presentation. Let me get it going. Just a second. Oh, here we go. Here we go. All right. So I have to say, if you had told me five or six years ago that I would be giving a presentation with the title, Quit Herbiciding Thistles in Natural Areas, I'd have absolutely thought you were crazy um, because I, and maybe many of you too, um, are under the understanding that Canada thistles are invasive. We need to treat them aggressively. Um, and 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 we did we did battle with them, as it were. But I have had a couple of restorations over the past of uh, you know handful of years here that have really made me do a 180 on this uh, situation. So the place where I learned the most was uh, is a place called Prairie Bluff Preserve. And I used to refer to it as the thistle capital of Will County, Illinois. And hopefully I'm cross my fingers, hopefully this year or next year, I can refer to it as the former thistle capital of Will County, Illinois. Um, it's about a 600 acre uh, former row crop ag uh, field in Lockport, Illinois. And the reason it was so thistly 
was because um, when it was still an ag, we had it in row crop uh, ag licenses for um, at least 10 years, actually more like 15. But when it was in ag, we severely restricted what chemicals the farmers could, could put on this field. And the reason for that is because Prairie Bluff is on um, the groundwater recharge zone for um, the, the seeps that feed um, the wetlands at Lockport Prairie. And those seeps provide habitat for a federally endangered dragonfly, the Heinz Emerald dragonfly. So um, water that falls on Prairie Bluff Preserve, um, you know, goes, it's really highly permeable soils. It goes very rapidly into the shallow aquifer, like within 24 hours. And within, on average, 48 hours, it seeps out the, at the base of the bluff into Lockport Prairie. So it's very quick infiltration and in discharge. And so chemicals don't have a lot of time to break down, um, you know, between when they're applied on the field and it rains and then they come out at La Prairie. So because of that, we'd had um, restrictions on the ag license that said no chemicals with groundwater advisories. And as it turns out, almost all the, the herbicides that actually kill Canada thistle, if you read them, they pretty much all have groundwater advisories. So we had restricted that over the course of, you know, a solid decade there to the point where the whole place was just thistles that the farmers were just sort of top killing, you know, with Roundup or whatever. And then, um, and every time, every season, basically, they just keep coming right back to the point where um, we couldn't find anybody to farm it. Between the thistles and the rocks, they, the farmers all just said, no, thanks, we're not doing that. Um, so that was around 2018 or so when the farmers quit. And um, and luckily we were able to find funding for restoration right at the, at the right time, which was great. Um, but what was interesting and what I've learned so much from is that the funding came, oh, wrong way, okay. Sorry about that. There was two major funding sources. And because of that, it was basically two projects that went on at once simultaneously, but they were very different. The contracting was different, the grants and funding sources were different, and the project approach ended up being really different as far as the thistles were concerned. So the Western project approach was basically don't worry about the thistles. And I don't, I know this wasn't the approach on purpose. Um, but it's just the way that it turned out the contractors were just busy and they didn't do anything about the thistles and there weren't any contractual ramifications for that. Um, and in contrast, the Eastern project approach was to battle the thistles. Um, and so let me give you the timeline on those. The Western approach, it got a really good proper dormant seeding in February of 2020. So it was dormant seeded with the full prairie and wetland mixes the seeding was done really well under really good conditions. That part of it was great. And then after that, basically they did nearly nothing for a couple of years. Kind of spot mowed a couple of weedy parts of the prairie, but not even that much of that. And honestly, I'm not quite sure that was really all that necessary or even beneficial since the parts that were mowed basically came in just the same as the parts that weren't mowed. So, but. It made them feel like they were doing something. It made the granting agency feel like they were doing something. So um, they did a little bit of a little bit of that. But besides that, they did not much went on those first couple of years. And then it was burned in March of 2022. Had a first had its first burn. So that was the Western project approach. It was basically got a good seeding and then very very little management for the next couple of years. The Eastern project approach was to battle the thistles. So that part of the project was boom sprayed with milestone herbicide during the fall of 2019. And milestone was chosen for this application because it's um, not very mobile in the soil as compared to other broadleaf herbicides. And because of the groundwater consideration, that's what steered the, that's what, um, steered the decision to uh, use milestone on that. Then it was seeded with native grasses and graminoids and uh, limited forbs, just ones that tend to be tolerant of milestone or transliner herbicide. And it got a good dormant seeding in February of 2020. 
So the, the seeding timing was exactly the same on those two. And then the um, and then in 2020, after it seeded, there wasn't much of anything in that restoration, really, just dead thistles from the previous year. Um, but the following year, 2021, the thistles resurged with a vengeance. There was a lot of thistle uh, bounce back. And um, so it was spot sprayed for thistles that summer, but the spot spray was so widespread that it was about as much herbicide went down as if it had been boom sprayed, honestly. And then it also got uh, its first prescribed burn in April of 2022. So those, that's the timeline. Let me show you some photos of how those two look different and, 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 you know, in some ways similar. Um, so at the beginning, the Western area was looking really rough, very, very rough. Um, it was mostly Canada thistles and South, South thistles, some ragweed, some foxtail, some maristail, you know, general, general first year weeds. Um, the Eastern area in contrast, um, just had dead thistles from the milestone boom spray. You kind of see the extent of what I'm talking about as far as how widespread those thistles were. They just covered, you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres out there. Then, so that's 2020. So that was, you know, the, the first growing season after it, they both were seeded. Then the Western area. So this is again, where the thistles were ignored. It basically got very little management those first couple of years. By 2022, so by the third growing season, the natives are starting to come in. You can see the wild rye coming in, some yellow coneflowers and black-eyed Susan, kind of, you know, a little rough, but kind of typical for that stage of restoration. Still patches of thistle were fairly widespread, less than they'd been initially, but still definitely present and, you know, here and there sort of throughout. Well, what was fascinating was by 2023, so by last summer, the natives were much more abundant. I mean, it's on track to be to be a decent restoration. There's still a lot of wild rye. The forbs are coming in nicely. A lot more um, wild quinine and silphiums are coming in. That restoration actually has um, the most uh, particular silanceolata I've ever seen in a restoration, which is just kind of bizarre. But anyway, um, but it, it's it's coming in nicely. And the thistles have almost completely faded. They're just, you know, you can still kind of stumble across a stunt, a stunted one here and there, but it's basically nothing compared to what, what they had been. And again, they had just been completely ignored. And in contrast, the Eastern area where the thistles, where we battled the thistles and sprayed them extensively, in 2022, um, so this was third growing season, the wild rye was abundant. Um, so the grasses were coming in fine. Uh, so it was, and there was still lots and lots of thistles. In 2023, ditto. The grasses have started to turn in sections, less wild rye, more big blue stem and such, um, but it's still just native grasses and thistles. They, um, they have persisted most definitely. So here's the side by side. When I was walking through the restorations last summer, this is this is the difference. So the western area, again, where the thistles were not managed, you know, they've faded away and the restoration is looking great. Where the thistles have been sprayed repeatedly, it's looking horrible, to be honest. It's looking very rough. And that just sort of um uh highlight highlighted for me that, you know, it's more of a competition. I, I'm kind of drawing the conclusion that it's more of a competition thing. The thistles are fading as the native forbs, especially, are getting well established. Whereas in the eastern area, where there's not native forbs, in large part because we sprayed for thistles, the thistles have not uh, faded. They are definitely still very, very present. So, a couple exceptions to this whole fading. Uh, phenomenon for thistles out at Prairie Bluff. 
So in the western part of Prairie Bluff, uh, where they faded, you know, across, you know, hundreds of acres, there, there's a couple of exception areas where they haven't faded. And one of those exception areas is um, along the trails. Uh, our landscape architects planted uh, turf grasses, you know, to be this mowed shoulder, shoulder along the trail. And the non-native cool season grasses have expanded out like, you know, 10 feet, 12 feet, something like that. And um, actually, I'm not very good. As I was telling Jamie before, I, I fractured my wrist and I'm trying to do things left-handed, so I'm not very good at it. But you can see, can you see the dividing line there between how far the cool season grasses have kind of have kind of marched out off of the trail shoulder? Um, and in that in that uh, cool season grass dominated area, the uh, there's still uh, goodly patches of thistles hanging on. Which, I mean, if you look at our roadsides, they're kind of testament to the fact that cool season grasses and thistles can pretty much coexist indefinitely together. So they definitely don't fade away just with any plant competition. Seemingly, maybe it's directly related to native form competition. So that's one that's one of the places where the the um, the thistles haven't faded away and it kind of might show the difference between pastures and roadsides and other places where thistles really do hang on for a long time versus a prairie restoration where where in my experience at least they faded away once the uh, once the native forbs um, uh, get well established. Let's see so this is prairie bluff this one was kind of my third uh, time of have, of noticing that the thistles have faded in, in different restorations. Um, and it's one of those things where if it happens once or even twice, you kind of think it might've been a fluke or, you know, whatever, but it, this was definitely the time for me that I saw it in stark enough contrast and, and sort of documented, I documented it well enough for myself that I'm, I was kind of feeling more confident that, you know, it's a thing. And so I've started to think of Canada thistles specifically as more of a symptom of a problem versus causing a problem. And, um, and so a symptom of a problem in most cases is just a lack of native cover, especially not enough native forbs. And sometimes that's just a factor of time, like the Western part of Prairie Bluff, you know, after, after seeding, it just takes some time for the native forbs to get to get uh, well established and, and, and with enough cover and enough competition to, to get the thistles to fade away. But in other projects, I've had it where they where thistles kind of persist, it has more to do with issues with the original seeding, like seedings that were done too late in the spring um, or where there was sort of um, uh, strippy seedings, you know, where they took the passes too wide and there is gaps between the seeding passes that didn't get much native seed. I've had, I had one project where the thistles kind of hung on in those gaps until the natives got, got well established. Or where there's like a seed mix hydrology mismatch, like a couple of minor areas um, I can think of at Prairie Bluff They'd been seeded wet prairie, um, but the hydrology was actually more mesic, not really so wet. And so those, the, the thistles hung on a little longer um, just because the initial seed mix, you know, not enough natives really established out of that, just given that that that, that they weren't well suited to, to the hydrology. Um, another project, it was related to prior invasive species treatments. Um, where we'd done a uh, cattail wick uh, project. And after we killed the wicked and killed the cattails, there was just a lot of open space. And surprisingly, the Canada thistles came in really heavy in some of those wet prairie uh, and even sedge meadow zones to the point where 10 years ago, I would have been extremely alarmed and, 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 and I would have treated them. But um, given my new mindset, we just let them be. And that was a couple of years ago. And now they've faded since um, the, the native sedges and, you know, other, other uh, native plants have gotten, you know, well-established again and recovered. 
And then another, I think, common uh, situation is that thistles can be a symptom of non-native cool season grass dominance, in which case I've sort of started to think of the non-native pasture grasses as being the, the primary problem and the thistles are just kind of a symptom of that problem. So with that being sort of my current thinking, in most cases, um, if the thistles are just a symptom of not enough native cover, then, um, then the prescription in a lot of cases might be to overseed, you know, to, to work on the, uh, on getting the native, the native uh, species, you know, and diversity uh, up to where it needs to be. So battling thistles with seed and not herbicide. All right, well, what to do, right? So a couple of years ago, I, uh, I was looking at this Prairie Bluff uh, Eastern restoration and I realized it's, it's, uh, it's not on the right track here. Um, the thistles aren't going away. It's diversity stinks. Um, it's needing what I think now is, is, or what I thought, you know, in my current mindset is that it needs to be overseeded. But I've made a very expensive mistake a couple of times in my career. And I was really wanting to avoid making that mistake again. And that mistake was that um, I have uh, in the past overseeded um, too soon after having sprayed thistles fairly widely in a restoration and gotten almost nothing out of those overseedings, like almost no establishment out of those. And that's a very expensive mistake. The seed is, is expensive and, and to get nothing out of it is really frustrating. And Prairie Bluff being, you know, hundreds of acres, I had money for seed, but I didn't want to overseed if the herbicide residual was so high that it was going to affect the establishment of that seeding. And so, so what we did was we laid off the herbicide and, and avoided spraying thistles for, for one full year, the summer of 2022. And at the end of that summer, then um, I tested the herbicide residual in the soil to see if it was low enough. Um, and I'll get to more of that here in the next slide. Um, and, and then based on the results of that herbicide residual uh, testing, we were able to overseed more diverse, more diverse um, and uh, seed mixes just this past February. So about, about one year ago. So the herbicide residual testing, this was, I thought this was really interesting. So there's two parts of it. One part was, um, was a, a lab component. So I took soil samples from nine different parts of that uh, restoration. One was sort of a control location that hadn't gotten any herbicide treatments. And then the other ones had gotten um, the milestone boom sprays and, and spot sprays and stuff. And I took them from wet prairie zones and mesic prairie and dry mesic prairie and dry to, to kind of get across the whole hydrology spe spectrum to see if, you know, if, if the herbicide concentrations would vary with uh, with the moisture regime. And for each of those soil samples, I sent part of it off to the lab. The, there's um, only a couple of labs in the country that can test for milestone or transline herbicides. And, um, and so one of them was the, uni the um, South Dakota Agricultural Laboratory. So I sent my soil samples off to them. And then part of the soil I took and sprouted and put them into um, plug trays and sprouted up some native species to see what happens. Because, I mean, I was kind of envisioning that if you get results back from the lab and it says, oh, you've got 10 parts per billion of whatever, the question is, is that a lot? Is that a little? It, you know, is that going to affect anything? So I wanted to kind of pair this, the lab analysis with actual, you know, uh, effects on on um, native plant establishment. So for each of the each of these treatments, um, the back left three cells. Oh, here, let me use my mouse. I'll try. I'll again. I'm so not coordinated with this left-handed. All right, here we go. So these three cells 
were um, planted with uh, black eyed Susans. These three were wild bergamot and the front two was cilantro. And the reason I chose these species, so black eyed Susan, it's easy to germinate, it germinates really readily. Um, it tends to be susceptible to both milestone and translite herbicides. Um, the wild bergamot also um, sprouts up pretty easily, but it, it tends, at least as adult plants, they tend to, it tends to be relatively resistant to milestone and transline herbicides. And then I did the cilantro just because it's an annual. I, I know it germinates really easily and I had an extra packet of seed lying around. So I just wanted to, to make sure that, you know, if, if thing, if the plants didn't come up, that it was, it wasn't, uh, you know, related to the amount of shade of my setup or I don't know, whatever. So, but that's what I did um, for each of those soil tests. This one happened to be Prairie Bluff number two. So the, this soil sample was um, fairly typical of a lot of them. It was from an area that had gotten broadcast sprayed with milestone herbicide one year before the soil test. When I sent it off to the lab, the amino pyrrolid, the uh, active ingredient in milestone, the level in the soil was below the lab's detection limit, which is good. That means that there, that there wasn't much in the soil. And the black eyed Susans and the wild bergamot, they all germinated. You can see in the fall of 2022 there. And they survived just fine to the following spring. So that was actually the case for nearly all of the soil samples which was good news. It meant that that, bro that, um, that broadcast spray, uh, the, the herbicide in the soils wasn't enough to at least affect germination and establishment of, of those species. Now, the one exception to that um, was at Prairie Bluff number six. So, that location had gotten broadcast sprayed with milestone herbicide one year before the soil test. And it had also gotten spot sprayed uh, for teasel right there with milestone herbicide two months before the soil test. And so when, I, when we sent that one off to the lab, the amino pyrrolid level in the soil was at six parts per billion. And the black eyed Susans, so the left three, so those three right there, um, they germinated fine, but then they died. The following spring, these are just uh, annual foxtail grasses in those uh, plug plug holes. So, so the black and Susans had died, but the wild bergamot, these three, as you can see those germinated fine and those survived as well. So honestly, this was kind of what I was expecting um, to happen at sort of like an intermediary level was where um, species that are tolerant of the milestone would be less affected than a species like uh, black-eyed Susan that are very susceptible to, to, the, to the herbicide. Um, but this was the one, the one location that had the highest amount of amino pyrrolid left. So because this was, you know, we didn't do much spot spring um, just before the soil test. The, this teasel location was kind of was kind of uh, one of the few. So based on based on these results, I felt okay going ahead and and dropping my hundred twenty thousand dollars on seed and overseeding last winter. One other place I did this the same um, type of soil herbicide experiment here was at an, this, so this was a different site where we'd, um, we had a restoration that had gotten broadcast sprayed with transline herbicide a fair amount. And we'd, over, I, we'd overseeded it once before and again, gotten nothing out of the seeding. So I was wondering if the, the soil herbicide um, residual levels were, were the reason for that. So this area had gotten broadcast sprayed with transline herbicide two years before the soil test. And then it got a broadcast spray uh, uh, with uncalibrated equipment um, with transient herbicide. They were just running 0.5% and they didn't bother properly calibrating it. Um, 
and that happened one year before the soil test. And so you'll note that the 40 fluid ounces per acre of, um, of herbicide was, that's above the, the labeled maximum annual amount per year that's allowable. So that was definitely an uncalibrated heavy spray. And the when I sent it off for testing, the uh, clopyridid level, that's the active ingredient in transline, the level in the soil was at 6.2 parts per billion. And so in that one, this kind of definitely highlighted for me how soil, how the, the herbicide residual works in soils. So the black-eyed Susans there, they germinated fine. You can see in the fall of 2022, the bergamot, wild bergamot came up fine, the cilantro came up fine, but the following spring, everything died in very dramatic fashion here. Here it is just sort of keeling over in the following spring. And um, yeah, so that was at 6.2 parts per billion. I had one soil sample there that came back at like three parts per billion and there um, everything germinated fine. And by the spring of 2023, the plants look kind of, they look weird, like purplish and, and a little sickly. Um, but uh, unfortunately the chipmunks got into my soil trays and, and, and completely trashed the, uh, the plugs before I could see what happened to those plants. So, so the three parts per billion, I don't know if those ended up pulling through or if they ended up dying, um, but it sort of, yeah, it sort of showed the levels of the soil, um, the herbicide levels that, that, that affect the plants. So a couple of conclusions on the soil herbicide residual uh, experiment. First is that it's possible and and I'd say advisable to send it off for testing if you think there might be an issue because you know native seed is very expensive and the the residual testing, you know, I think for my dozen samples, it was you know a thousand dollars or something like that. but um, whether or not to to spend you know hundred twenty thousand dollars on money on seed, is uh, it's definitely worth wor money worth spending, I think. The other thing that is sort of highlighted for me was um, to be mindful of uncalibrated spraying. So the, the places where the herbicide levels came back as being significant enough to affect, uh, affect the seed establishment were where, we, where there was uncalibrated spraying. One was a backpack spot spray, one was an un uncalibrated boom spray. I can imagine a tank and gun spray would, would also put out a lot of herbicide and do a similar thing. Um, but it was kind of uh, encouraging that one single boom spray, according to label uh, instructions, you know, a year after that, um, the soil herbicide level was back down to where it didn't seemingly affect the uh, plant establishment at all. And the other consideration was that the, the places where we had um, issues with the soil herbicide residual being too high had also gotten two consecutive years of spraying. So there, there's certainly potential for an accumulation um, factor going on with the herbicide levels building up. All right. So yeah, I again, I um, I am not quite sure I ever thought I would be saying this, but let me give you my top reasons to stop spraying thistles. Number one, as the western part of Prairie Bluff sort of really drove home for me, it's unnecessary. The uh, the as long as the native seed establishment is good, then the thistles uh, they faded out with time, and I'd, I'd say that's the most dramatic of my experiences, but but you know, as I've been sort of going this direction over the past several years, you know, it's happened enough times that I'm starting to feel confident about it. So number one, it's unnecessary. And even beyond that, number two, it's counterproductive. What the soil herbicide um, sort of uh, aspect of this highlighted for me is that if thistles are really um, 
just there because there's a lack of native competition. Spraying them, you know, kills the thistles, but it also kills other native forbs that are right there that could potentially outcompete them in time. And it also, and spraying them also um, has the effect of killing, you know, the with the with the soil residual, killing native seed that could germinate to outcompete the thistles. So it's yeah, I've I've sort of moved to the point of it actually being actively counterproductive. Reason number three, I mean, let's face it, we all have more acres to manage and less resources to do so than than you know than we really want to need. So there's so many invasives that we're that we're facing that are actively displacing native plant communities and 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 you know having a very bad effect. You know, I'm thinking Phragmites and Reconary grass and common buckthorn and honeysuckle, all the invasive shrubs. I'm sure we can all rattle off a, a short, short dozen list of our worst invasive species. Um, yeah, we have we have so so many to to do that. I mean, if we spend our resources spraying thistles, we're taking away from other things that we could and should be doing. I think it's important to kind of distinguish between weeds that are symptoms of problems versus causing problems. And by symptoms of problems, I mean ones that are just kind of occupying space when there's space available. And I've, you know, long, long time I've realized that like annual weeds and restorations, you know, like your mare's tail and your foxtail and, and even one time uh, I had a whole field of dandelion come up in a restoration, you know, stuff like that, you know, those, those, annual species, um, definitely they come in strong and then they fade away once the once the native seed mix gets established. And it's been lovely to be able to put kind of thistles into that category of weeds that are cause that are symptoms of a problem, usually being not enough native cover, versus causing problems that to the point and needing actual control uh, to 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 you know, to get them out of there. And so with um, thistles often being a, a symptom that there's not enough native cover, a lot of times the prescription is to combat them with overseeding and not herbicide. And the the top reason for me is, um, oh my gosh, for the past couple of years, since I've been able to walk by thistles and not worry about them, it's Restorations are so much easier. It's, it's oh my gosh. So so let it be easy. Just do a really good seeding and then do more by doing less for a while. Just let let the plants establish and and um yeah, not worry about the thistles. It's it's wonderful. All right. So that was what I have for you today. I'm not quite sure, Jamie, um, if you'd like me to stop presenting and do do the question thing, or how we want to do this. Oh, that that's perfectly fine to leave to to leave your slide slide up. I encourage folks okay. to 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 um, type questions into the chat box or raise your hand. I'm going to click the buttons now to allow mics um, for for part participants. So yeah, uh, so Julie, thank you so thank you so very much. This this was this was uh really uh really great great to hear another um tool in our toolbox and then uh, also right the you know we we're continuing to build this uh this body of knowledge with you know with within our prairie reconstruction you know communities uh, you know about reacting to the you know in, invasive species right and and I have the same reaction as you right oh Canada thistle must go out and spray rather than taking a step back and and analyzing like okay what's you know is this is this a symptom of something else and 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 can I reach my my goals, you know, whether that's you know a diverse prairie planting um without expending you know so 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 much time time and energy as as we have in in the past. So thank you so very much. Um okay, so uh Sarah asks, um was west versus east something you had planned for comparison? 
or or uh, did it just did it turned out to be a good demonstration? Yeah, I, I, I didn't plan it whatsoever. Um, it just happened that um, because the the funding sources for the restoration were different, um, the contracting ended up very different. So the Western project area was funded by um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, as part of their 206 uh, money. I don't remember what 206 stands for, but it's um, habitat restoration projects. And, but the they're actually administered. The, the contracting is done by the Army Corps of Engineers. And the way that they'd set up their contracting, um, there weren't um, uh, like intermediary performance standards. The, the contractor just had to make some standards by like year five or year six or something like that. And in this particular contract, they just didn't do anything for a couple of years. So, and there weren't ramifications for that. So in hindsight, it was 100% the, the right move. And I'm very glad that it happened that way. But at the time I was jumping up and down and yelling because they weren't addressing the invasive species. But I, I'm very happy that I was completely, turns out I think wrong about it. And I'm, Oh, Julie, did we? Uh oh, I think we, <laughs> I think we just lost our, um, lost our speaker. So let's see if she's, she's able to, um, able to re reconnect. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's see if she can get back. I just sent her a message. Sorry about that, folks. But that is sometimes, sometimes we our uh, connections are out of our control. I don't have any um, old music. Oh, there she is. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Julie, are you back? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Great. Okay. There's more. Are you uh, uh, are you ready for some 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 more questions? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, yes. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, I, I asked Ben ask have you have you ever used um, contact herbicide application uh, rather than spraying? Uh oh, <laughs> looks like she's uh, maybe she might have some connection problems. Darn, sorry about that again, folks.
no, sorry about that. Uh, no, not a problem, right? We, we, right, we, we, we understand that we, the technology is great, but not always, not always foolproof. Okay, so here, here, here we go. Have you ever used a contact herbicide application rather than spraying? For thistles? Yes, back a long time ago. And honestly, it did it top killed them and then they came right back was, was what I remember from that. Okay. Um, uh, Kurt asked, based on your experience, what is the expected residual longevity on milestone? I've heard um, that it's 12 to 18 months. I remember reading that from, um, this was not my study. This was some, some herbicide study. Um, that's what I heard for milestone. I, I think I read that transline was more like nine to 12 months, something like that, or six months, something along those lines. Um, but what, yeah, what I found in, in at Prairie Bluff, at least, was that it seemed to potentially be shorter than that. Because by, mm -hmm. you know, one year after the broadcast spray, it was the herbicide residual in the soil was down to being not detectable. So, yeah. It may be a, okay. a little shorter than what I had originally thought. Good to know. Jessica asked, do you have a suggestion where the uh, the the line is of uh, to give the natives a chance to outcompete the invasives versus the natives cannot outcompete because the invasives are uh, too prevalent? I guess, I guess, you know, where's your line, I guess, uh, your decision point maybe to where, where you're going to uh, do management rather than uh, rather than let it let it grow. Well, one of the things I, I've thought is that there's some invasives where um, they're going to uh, just take over everything. You know what I mean? Where there's where, you know, um, like Phragmites is one of those, you know, Recanary grass is one of those, like where, you know, there's no tolerable amount in my book. You know what I mean? So that jump on them early, jump on them often, keep them out as, as well as you can. But there's other non-natives that are so, sort of maybe, um, maybe what, aggressive what and... What plant is she talking about? Ah. Uh, <gasps> oh, your European marsh thistle? And I have no experience with that one. Was that? Oh okay, yeah, so, go go ahead, Julie. So I guess I guess um uh kind of thistles in particular, but other annuals and biennials maybe might fall in this category too, uh, are ones where, I mean, at, at Prairie Bluff, I mean, it was probably pushing like 80% cover or something out there. There was a lot of it, like a serious amount. And I was absolutely shocked to find that, you know, even where it wasn't managed, that, that all of that basically faded away. It was just, it was just absolutely mind blowing to me, to be honest. So I'm kind of currently thinking that it's not so much the amount of cover of non-natives or invasives, it may be the species of them is more the determining factor in terms of how much tolerance to have for them or not have for them. Hmm. Very good. Uh, Dan asked, would triclopyr or do you know if triclopyr uh, has the same residual half-life? I, again, my under, I didn't test um, triclopyr because we hadn't used it on either of those areas, but I, my understanding is that triclopyr is a little shorter, you know, and, and it's vast line is slightly different than 3A, I think, but mm. I seem to remember it being more on the couple month timetable. Okay, thank you. And then John asked, um, or can you, or how would you rank the common herbicides, I guess the common herbicides used in reconstruction work, according to their length of time as problem 
soil residuals, including triclopyr, milestone, transline, glyphosate? Yeah, I think um, milestone and um, amazapyr, which is habitat or Polaris, those I think have the longest residual. And then a little less than that is transline. And then a little less than that is the, the triclopyr products. And then I think my understanding was that glyphosate tends to have one of the least uh, persistent, persistent ones. Great, thank you. So Jonathan asked, would you say this approach applies best for Canada thistles specifically and less for other problematic thistles and or weeds with lar large ro rosettes? In Oregon, Canada thistle can be a bit spindly, which allows natives to grow alongside it, but milk thistle and other weeds like teasel and tansy ragwort can be larger and more controlling of soil space, which may be more demanding of herbicide treatments to prevent take takeover. Yeah, it could be. I, I didn't have enough thistles of other species to kind of say one way or another out there. Although we did, we do have um, some uh, carduus, the plumeless thistles are kind of here and there. The um, bull thistles are kind of here and there a little bit, the Circe and Bulgari. Um, and those have, we haven't specifically treated or not treated them any differently than the Canada thistles. And they haven't increased and in, in may have decreased um, as the prairies have come in, but there wasn't really enough of them for me to say one way or the other on those guys. Okay, very good. Uh, Molly has has a great comment here, more, more thistle talk. Um, I've tried adding native thistles to the seed mix to compete with Canada thistle, but the native thistles always get sprayed by staff who can't tell the difference. So I've quit putting it in the seed mix in most places, but I've always wondered if it wouldn't help fill that niche. Yeah, entirely might. Yeah, we we used to have the same issue when we were treating the Canada thistles, which we haven't for several years now. But back when we were, yeah, especially when they were small rosette stage, mm -hmm. yeah, you get a lot of uh, you know desirable thistles that would get treated too. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Bob uh, has a question here. European marsh thistle uh, can be difficult in shoreline and wetland areas along Lake Michigan, often exhibiting aggressive behavior. These are generally natural undisturbed areas, although fluctuating water levels may be a driver of disturbance. Any insights or thoughts for dealing with European marsh thistle? Uh, in intact systems? Not for me. Anybody else? I have no experience <laughs> with those. Okay, yeah. If anybody else does, yeah, uh, raise your hand or, or type it in. Um, so Ryan asked, how does spot mowing fit into this conversation, especially in areas of reconstructions that exhibit dense patches of candida thistles with virtually no native pre presence? Can thoughtfully timed mowing help in this case? Yeah, you know what? We did, the contractor did some spot mowing in the Western area during those first couple of years. And they spot mowed some of it, but not all the dense patches. Like they just did part of the project area, not the, the rest of the project area. And I, at the time, I had thought that, that the areas that had gotten spot mowed would come in better than the ones where they have did 100% nothing for the for the thistles and I'm surprisingly it didn't make any difference hmm. so yeah it made them feel better and it made the granting agency feel better like they were actually doing something but in the hmm. end I'm I'm not sure it was really all that helpful to be honest wow very very insightful yeah we're gonna have to explore that more <laughs> um yeah do you do you have so Eric asks uh, do you have a suggestion for managing by overseeding uh, in rangelands or native unplowed prairie that has had a lot of past disturbance and subsequent Canada thistle invasion? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the more the more I've sort of done the restorations, the more significance I've put in and priority that I've put on seeding. 
you know, getting good seating and doing it well. And yeah, I'd say absolutely overseeding if, if it's, you know, if, if the thistles are there and to my eyes right now, that's kind of a symptom that there's not enough natives in a lot of cases, then yeah, seeding might be exactly what the doctor orders on this one. Yeah, and and that oh, that topic of overseeding was one that that came back from a lot of the reconstruction community too. That 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 sounds like folks, um, you know, on the ground management folks really would like to 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 explore uh, more, right? You know the you know the process and 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 technique and what works and what what doesn't work. So, um, hopefully, we can have that conversation in in the future about more. Uh, more results from from over overseeding experience. Um, so there's uh, oh here's one another one uh, question that just just come in uh, from John. Are there other plants that you think would follow your experience with Canada thistle, such as mullen? Mullen, absolutely. I'm kind of curious about wild parsnip as another one that um this is one i'm i'm kind of going to test in a couple places here coming up that might be one of those species that you know uh coexists with cool season grasses quite happily mm. in our roadways and that sort of thing but but um maybe more of a symptom of a lack of native cover that mm. that's completely speculation here on my part right now um but uh yeah uh, uh, there's a lot of um annual and biennial and short-lived sort of non-natives that I think may fall into this category of being kind of a symptom that there's open space available, basically, and not enough cover to to outcompete them. Okay, yeah. thanks, Julie. Uh, Jessica comments: Folks in Saskatchewan, Canada, have had success in overseeding forbs, so we can have that. Yeah, there's there's some some experience. Sounds like on the ground there, and then Dan asked. Uh, or makes a comment, it's time consuming, but I've clipped the flowers off of thistles throughout the year when it's small enough, uh, it's a small enough patch and had success in greatly decreasing the density in following years as the natives grow in uh, um, uh, around them. Yeah, so thank, thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions either typed or or, or voiced for uh, Julie today? Um, if not, I thank all of you uh, in the audience for coming out and, and participating. And uh, this is how we hopefully uh, learn together as a reconstruction community. And, and Julie, um, I sincerely thank you for your time and talent and for uh you know giving your presentation today about about your experience with with prairie re reconstruction so um thanks again oh thank you yeah it was great it was great forum thank you and then if folks oh if folks uh i i'm guessing if folks uh had other questions for you would 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 you be open to um uh to, to other questions or email questions of course okay great great um, okay, uh, this is this is it for our winter uh, webinar series, and then uh, I'll send out a notice if you are on our Prairie Reconstruction Initiative email list, and you can go to the website to sign up for that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll send that notice out when we get them up on our U YouTube channel, so so folks can uh, and others who didn't make it can come and watch this again. So, uh, thank thanks again, and everyone. Be well. Thanks, Julie. Thank you.